I have a question uh, from Nan via Twitter. Um, and the question is, how is shrinking the public sector and freezing wage do anything positive to the provincial economy? Okay, so uh, for people that may not have context uh, for that question, uh, I believe uh, that question is referring to um, what I guess my most public profile has been since being finance minister is around labor, uh, public sector labor negotiations that have been ongoing uh, since I came into uh, to this role as finance minister. Um, and what I did uh, coming in was met with public sector labor leaders uh, collectively to advise them of what the direction was going to be to public sector employers. And the direction was the, the public service sustainability mandate. Uh, and that mandate essentially said that we can't jeopardize our fiscal plan. Because when we do a budget, it's not just the one year that it really focus on, uh, but in fact, we actually do forecast out another three years. Um, not in as much detail, but it does give an idea of where we're going to be spending. So even if you don't uh, see the results of, of questions and comments, we will, uh, you know, it may impact our planning for future years as we transition. When it comes to the public sector, uh, what our, our, our sustainability plan, and, and there was some negotiations and some tentative agreements reached in uh, early December, um, it essentially had uh, some zeros, no wage growth um, to the, the compensation. Um, what's important to note, that is in many uh, public sector collective agreements, um, and those provisions uh, would have been maintained, uh, include growth in, in steps that get received. So when we talk about an, an economic uh, increase and when the public talks about, um, uh, when, you, when you hear about in the, in the news about negotiations uh, and you hear about the wage increase, that's the overall increase at every step. Um, so many employees, particularly early in their careers, do get increments and, and stepped increases. So they will see growth uh, for many of the employees in the public sector, even when a, a collective agreement may still have a 0% negotiated position. It just means those steps will not increase from year over year, but people will still go up those steps and see increases in their, uh, their take home pay for many of the employees, unless you're at the top of a step and, and, and hit that ceiling, uh, in which case you'd have to uh, move to another level of, of employment um, to, to see the growth. So it's not about free, you know, it's, it's about controlling and as I mentioned earlier, we need to control our, our expenditures. If we're not seeing significant growth, right, we're already spending more than we take in. So in the absence of a huge influx of revenue, I ask all Nova Scotians how we're expected to pay for growth in uh, our programs and services. So that's, that's just the situation we're in. Very good, thank you very much. I'm going to take uh, one question uh, via email and then I'm going to open the floor to, uh, to the audience here at the Mount for a question. Um, and the question via email is, why are you using um, austerity to balance the budget? It hasn't worked elsewhere, for example, Greece. So what, uh, you know, using the, the term austerity where you really want to focus on where there's, there's, there's tons of cuts, I think uh, if you actually look at what we've done as a government, uh, again, there are areas that may have seen decreases in, in certain areas uh, of a budget, but you can see areas where there have been increases as well. If you actually look at our, our net expenses, you will see that under our, our governments, you've actually seen growth in those expenses. What I've been focused on and, and what I've been talking about and, and the focus and the direction is on fiscal sustainability. It's about bringing the rate of growth of our expenses in line uh, so that we are spending what we can afford to spend. That means slowing our rate of growth in our spending, especially in the fact that we're seeing a, a slowdown in our rate of growth in revenue. But don't forget, we're already starting from a negative place. We're starting from a place where we're already spending more money than we take in. So we do have to slow down our rate of growth. And this does tie into actually that, that earlier question about, again, why is it so important for the province to have manageable and sustainable collective agreements? Uh, it's because those collective agreements, wages and salaries, compensation for employees across all of government, accounts for over 50 cents of every dollar. So if we're going to control and manage our spending, we have no choice but to ensure that, again, what we spend on our people, and they are valuable people, 
uh, whether they're, they're here in, in universities uh, providing education in classrooms in P to 12 or in early education, in our hospitals, in our doctor's offices, um, you know, people plowing our driveways or our roads in, in storms, in transportation. Valuable services, important people. We value the work that they do. This isn't a question about whether we value their, their, their work, it's about whether and how much we can afford to increase the pay for that work. Very good, thank you so much. Um, I'd like to um, open the floor to the community at the Mount here it, to see if there are any questions. What question over here? And if you want to introduce yourself to start with. Hi, I'm uh, Cindy Garland. I'm a student, a mature student here at the Mount. And prior to my education here, um, I, I didn't know much about politics and finance and economics. So I'm a little bit green, but I've learned a lot since I've been here. Um, in business, uh, what I'm learning about is what it takes for a business to be sustainable and profitable. And I'm wondering um, if it's not an option I realize that there's a high debt and all that, but should we not invest in our province, our business, be it by borrowing, and then that investment allow the economy growth, the economic growth to then come back around, same as a business or corporation? Is that not feasible? I know sustainability, it, it may not happen as quickly, but is that not another possibility that uh, you know to so if uh, just want to make sure ev everyone heard so essentially the question is uh, really the need to invest uh, in order to spur economic growth uh, so I think uh, if you look at the history of this province uh, we do have a history of investing in various organizations but I also think that if you look at that history we have not necessarily been great at selecting the investments that return the greatest economic value. So I mentioned earlier about structural change and I think economic development is actually a great example of structural change that was brought forward by this government in the last budget. Prior to, um, you know, well, last year, I guess, so we had uh, for many years a department in the government called Economic, Rural Development and Tourism. It was essentially responsible for economic development and making those types of investment decisions. But when you actually look at the evidence, and this is the important thing, is lining up and saying, we have objectives. That's exactly the objective we want. When we make investments as a government uh, from an economic perspective, we want to see those returns uh, coming back. So when we look at the, the, the programs and the effectiveness of, of that, uh, or if we look at a program that we, we did away with, uh, when we first came in, got a lot of press during the election campaign, the Jobs Fund, which was a huge pile of money that uh, elected officials, cabinet was choosing where to spend that money. We didn't see the best outcomes necessarily. Uh, so we changed all that. We actually dismantled the entire Economic Rural Development Department. Many of the programs, the ones that we thought we're good. We're moved around into other departments. So uh, programs like the uh, that was providing summer employment for students, I think would be relevant here, moved over to labor and advanced education because we felt labor and advanced education is the department most closely aligned with both the workforce and the student population. So to be able to affect change and align what the labor market needs and for students, so in investing in our students and investing in our employers to facilitate, so again, the START program, graduate opportunities, a number of apprenticeship programs uh, to help whether you're in a university or a community college, they're investing there and we're seeing returns. So we are still investing and from a business where we invest in, in companies, uh, we already had Nova Scotia Business Inc., so some of those programs that were in economic rural development got moved over to Nova Scotia Business Inc. That is the organization, it's a crown corporation, arm's length from the politicians, which would assess a business opportunity, so a company that, that's looking for investment would go to Nova Scotia Business Inc. They have a number of programs, one that you probably hear about the most frequently, I think just recently you heard one in the, the blueberry uh, sector uh, with uh, the Oxford uh, frozen, frozen fru Foods. Uh, investments through payroll rebate is a particular uh, mechanism uh, for investment. If you are 
perhaps at the university uh, level. You've heard about some of the sandboxes that uh, the, the uh, government has and partnered with, with various universities, but for innovation and for early stage startups, if there's any entrepreneurs in the room uh, or online, uh, you'd be looking at InnovaCore, which tends to look at investment in early stage uh, ideas. There was a recent competition, actually just maybe a week or so ago, uh, they had a big competition, partly sponsored by our federal uh, partners with ACOA, uh, to recognize innovative ideas and, and, and uh, uh, product ideas being developed by Nova Scotians and giving them some seed money, but they also invest in venture capital and, and so on. So that type of program would be a Nova Corps. And then we created a new entity called Invest Nova Scotia. And that entity uh, just got up and running in the fall. Their applications are online, but it's looking for sector development growth. So not a, a one company, but if an industry association is saying, you know what, we can, you know, with some support, it levels the playing field because an investment in an industry is good for all of the businesses in that sector or that industry. So they would be looking to invest Nova Scotia as a means. So, so the investment is happening and it's looking to drive, but it's gone through some structural change since we've come into office because we believe if we look at our past history, we think we can do better. And so that's what we're trying to do. I'm Minister Delory, Nick Langley with the Canadian Federation of Independent Business and we represent 5,200 small business owners in the province. Uh, I was glad to hear comments about growing the economy. Uh, as you know, uh, small businesses are really the engine of our economy, employ almost half of our provincial workforce. And a lot of great things have happened this year with regulatory reform and we hope to see a lot more, which makes it a better environment for small business. So. What, without giving your budget away, of course, but what initiatives are you looking at in terms of growing uh, the economy to help uh, create a larger tax base, which is great for, for everybody? Um, because one thing I, I will caution is, uh, which I was happy to hear about uh, rates, is small business right now is, is burdened here in the province with rates. So what innovative ideas are you looking at and your government on helping to foster that. Okay, thanks, uh, thanks Nick, um, for, uh, for that and, and for the work, uh, and, and for the work of the, the small business sector, of, of course, uh, and their contributions to the economy. I mean, a big part of my s discussion so far has been focused on that challenge on the revenue side, and, and, and they will be part of that. Um, without giving away budget, you're right, I mean, I can't speak to any specific policy type things, but in general, as, as per the last question, I mean, those are some structural changes. And we're in a, we are still in that state of transition for many of those things. So we're continuing certainly to focus on the implementation, on assessing to ensure, you know, the changes or any programs. Do we need any other program changes? You know, again, maybe one program's not as good as something else. Should we change that? Those are the types of discussions and, and, and again, feedback and, and priorities and, and input that we want to hear from people. Uh, specifically to tax rates, again, we had an extensive year well versed in it and your membership would be, but the students may not. Uh, I mentioned the One Nova Scotia Coalition report, but shortly after that, uh, there was also a Laurel Broughton, or, or actually it was uh, the Finance Department, Laurel Broughton was the uh, author, uh, but it was the Tax and Regulatory uh, Review, uh, did an extensive assessment of uh, the tax system, had a number of recommendations in there. Um, and we've moved, as you mentioned, positively on the regulatory front and we'll continue that work. Um, and I think that's a great example to show where we can invest in things that can have a big impact, but not huge costs. And in fact, might even actually streamline and, and ensure that we're operating more efficiently and effectively. And that's the work that the new Office of Regulatory Affairs, which also came into effect. So it's still in its infancy, in its first year of operation, and you're already seeing some positive results. So we're continuing to do those things. From the tax side of it though, and that's the other half of the Lowell Broughton, re, the, 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 the report on tax and regulatory uh, reform, um, that re report was designed and, and assessed and, and was very clear at the front end, you, not to be cherry picked. So it was designed as a total package. And we heard, and, and Minister Whalen, when, when she, my predecessor in, in the finance, went around last year, talked to, as part of the, the budget consultation, big focus was that report because it had just been released. And I think uh, it's safe to say that there was uh, not generally a consensus on everything in that report. 
which is why we continue to look at what and where, because when we move the levers, we just want to make sure any levers, are, is particularly around tax reform, um, we're lining it up appropriately. So continuing to look at and assess uh, what it may look like uh, when it may be implemented, um, no, no firm decisions have been made. But, but it's not, uh, it's not you know, the concerns and suggestions aren't going un unnoticed. Hi, my name is Chanel Masril. Um, I'm a student here in the Tourism and Hospitality Management Program at the Mount. Um, my question, um, well, you touched upon uh, looking into different industries in the province and seeing if you can invest further into them. Um, my question is uh, just seeing that tourism is such an important industry in Nova Scotia, um, generating, I think, about $2 billion in revenue and creating over 20,000 jobs. Um, can we expect to see more investment in this industry or what, I guess, what can we expect for that? Yes, so, so tourism and, 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 you know, as far as uh, specifics, I, again, I mean, in the budget, we're still going through, so I, I can't get into what one may expect uh, in that sense. But as far as uh, recognizing tourism as, a, a, as an area of, of interest and special interest, uh, remember I mentioned that structural change to that earlier question, economic, rural development and tourism, it was one part of an entire department. Within that structural change, that's the one area I didn't touch on, is tourism actually section got spun off to be a crown corporation. Uh, again, uh, w through our assessment uh, and evaluation, what we said is, you know, are you know, government officials the ones best suited to assess and review and align uh, what the needs of the tourism sector, sector are? Or is creating a board of people involved in the tourism sector and associated uh, that have a track record of success better able to manage and assess an, an organization that's Tourism Nova Scotia, now a Crown Corporation. Uh, so again, it will only be going into its first full year of operation in the, in the new fiscal year. But that was, again, a structural thing we've changed. Um, how they deliver the programs may become a bit different, but the intention and the objective is certainly to, to do better. And one of the things that we've been hearing from, from um, the tourism sector uh, has been, you know, as a province, you know, what we need, so if I'm speaking on behalf of people working in the tourism sector, we need our more tourists coming to Nova Scotia, right? And as the finance minister, I agree. A resident of Anakinish going to Digby, great for Digby, but the amount of money they would spend, if it's not new spending, the money's being recycled within Nova Scotia. There'll be some impact and value because they are spending money and it's working its way through the economy. But we get far more value if we have someone from the U.S. coming into Nova Scotia, someone new, someone from outside of Nova Scotia. That's new money that gets left in Nova Scotia. So there's a really a, a, an interest in focus on what kind of programs and initiatives can really draw new people in. So then the tourism operators and, and organizations on the ground can work to provide a great experience for them. But for the province, we really want to try to draw those, those, those people into the province and, and uh, that has a big marketing focus, I, I think, of, of course. And I don't think that's secret. Uh, you know, th they've been working on, on things like that. Question from um, Chris via Twitter. And the question is, what is Nova Scotia's plan for P3? Continuing status quo won't help save money. If we saw the figures, we would see why. Okay, so... Um, I guess I'm not sure which direction uh, Chris is, is leaning on the P3 when he talks about the, the status quo because, uh, and again, for those of you uh, online and, and here in, in the audience, I'm not sure if you know P3, but private uh, public partnerships is what the P3 uh, acronym stands for. Uh, what they essentially are is a, a, an area when uh, the, the public sector partners with the private sector to advance something. Um, you know, often in, in it's referred to in, in a capital context, uh, but I, I guess it doesn't have to be just capital projects, it could be in services. Um, so I'm not sure where the question was going in terms of status quo. I mean, there are some historical uh, P3 initiatives, uh, schools uh, are one, uh, so they're, they're actually coming to the, the, the end of their agreement in terms of lease, and so there will be some decisions uh, around those that will have to be made in the, in the coming year and years. Uh, about some, some P3 schools uh, are based on the contracts uh, that were signed about uh, 18 uh, years ago. Um, so, so those are decisions that will be made uh, uh, going forward and, and, and being assessed uh, now as to what the right decisions are. Um, 
other examples of P3s, the, uh, Halifax, the uh, new Halifax Convention Center, the one that's going up. Uh, I'm <laughs> that way. Uh, yeah, I'm from Anakinish, sorry. Um, and this is a new building on the mount, so at the mount. Um, so there's another example of a, a, a P3 partnership that's a current one. Uh, it, it's uh, going up now. Uh, so again, I'm not sure. I mean, uh, P3 is really about how you fund uh, initiatives, uh, the nature of your, your, your uh, contract or partnership you might enter into would be something you would assess uh, uh, based upon a given opportunity that comes up. Uh, and, uh, and I think uh, the Minister of Transportation Infrastructure Renewal, Minister McClellan, um, has made uh, comments like that in the, in the past that, you know, if uh, you're looking at P3s, what, what does it mean? Um, it's not a good word, it's not a bad word, it's just a word, it's just a, a, a tool in the toolbox. Thank you, Minister. Uh, David McGilvery, uh, investment advisor in Halifax, but from Antigonish, so I won't give you too hard a time. Uh, just a, a, a suggestion and then a, and the comment, and then if, if you wouldn't mind commenting on my comment. <laughs> uh, the su suggestion is related to the priorities. So uh, when you look at the expenditures of the province and how they relate to the priorities, there seems to be not necessarily direct, direct correlation between the two and sometimes the, the I looked at the first priority which was lifelong learning which could be potentially a bucket that you pour a tremendous amount of money in which has no specific uh, result uh, I don't disagree with it but I think you need specific and measurable uh, uh, priorities and objectives uh, the second uh, and, my, and my comment is related to uh, our, our debt financing so you had mentioned it's our debt financing is about nine hundred million dollars a year, uh, and our service delivery is essentially healthcare, education, uh, and um, services and infrastructure. Why do we run the liquor store? Uh, uh, it, it seems like the best and easiest way to reduce our debt obligation. Um, I've heard numbers anywhere between three billion and five billion dollars that we might get by privatizing uh, uh, the liquor, liquor Commission, uh, we would still get the tax revenue and we would still regulate it. Uh, that, you know, that's a third of our debt. That would drop down our interest, our debt servicing, by essentially what our deficit is. Mm -hmm. Thoughts? So uh, that's the, the, you know, in my discussions, the first time someone specifically brought it up. Uh, in general, I would say even before I got into politics, it's something that's out there that, that people talk about. Um, I can't speak uh, to um, historical decisions in, in that context uh, in terms of why, um, other than some background research I did. And I think uh, when you do that, it, it comes into the establishment of why did it come into existence in the way it did. So when you ask the question of why doesn't and don't governments, there are many jurisdictions across the country that do not privatize uh, and have a privatized uh, liquor uh, commission. Um, I think it relates to an historical context as to what the purposes and the objectives of uh, the government control of, of that uh, industry and association and you know, is. So uh, I would say that's probably in the historical context. As far as commenting on uh, you know, the uh, assessments, uh, submit a, 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 a submission on your uh, suggestion and we can take a look at the details of what it might be. But I haven't done that, so I, c I can't comment in, in the details. Minister, a um, few comments. Uh, I'm a student here. I moved here from Vancouver, so I'm actually one of the odd people that have come across the other way. So I feel I have a bit of an uh, interesting perspective in moving to Nova Scotia. I feel that your uh, kudos to you do in doing this uh, initiative of uh, trying to get input from people. You're stuck in a, between a rock and a hard place, I think. Um, one thing I notice, uh, lowering, lowering health care costs and coming here, I do feel that uh, in general there's a, the population is a little bit unhealthy at times. Um, so I see that that's a very huge cost in, in, uh, in your thing. So I was just wondering what, uh, you, what you guys are doing to uh, 
Yeah. Okay, so uh, again, uh, and, and actually you, you talked about that in terms of priority. I'm going to jump back to Dave. One thing I forgot, uh, Dave, was uh, uh, you mentioned about the priorities and you just touched on the lifelong learning. On that first slide when I talked about the priorities, they weren't necessarily in any sequence. It was just these were some examples. And the lifelong learning was to highlight education broadly because it starts in early years and up. So I just didn't want you to leave with the impression that that list was in a prioritized sequence. It was just an example of where broad level key priorities are. To the point of, uh, of the healthcare, again, back to that list where talk about structural change. That's another example of where we've made uh, broad structural changes uh, uh, with an eye towards getting our health care costs under control. Again, this was actually a, a key platform plank in our election, uh, so I'm not sure when you came over, if you were here in the fall of 13 during the provincial election or not. So, so during the campaign, uh, health care reform was a significant part of that for our government, uh, in particular, our party, I guess, uh, in particular, uh, campaigned on restructuring. Uh, prior to the you know, in, in the last two years, I mean, it's been a big part of what we've been doing in the legislature as well is creating a, a framework. So previously, uh, we had uh, 10 uh, health authorities uh, regions, and they operated independently uh, of other regions. Um, so the Department of Health and Wellness would give up money and, and, and objectives, but, you know, uh, I belong to a region serviced by Gasha in, in that part of the province. Um, Capital Health serviced the, the Halifax uh, area. Uh, well, they may have their own priorities within their region and, and they would invest that way. So you might actually be getting a different health service and things, but you have all these administrative costs that are duplicated right. doing that. So we've amalgamated that and we're working through that transition. Is there, is there a plan coming forward to address health issues in the, in the general community? So you're looking at uh, how do we, uh, preventative side of, uh, yeah, so I think uh, that side of it would be more in terms of specifics because the health is uh, such a large uh, group. Uh, the work that they're doing there, again, right now, a, a lot of their attention and focus is on getting that administrative restructuring in place to ensure that we continue to provide and, and, and uh, you know, with the objective of improving the health services that are being delivered uh, to Nova Scotians, but also doing it, again, through the administrative restructuring, through savings there. So we're not, you know, again, controlling the, the growth in our cost. That's a big big, big initiative. Um, but that said, even before the restructuring, I know the health department uh, and, and within the health uh, structure, they do have uh, efforts and initiatives and various programs. I don't have the litany of, of what specific ones they do have uh, or what ones they'd be changing. The Minister of Health may have more details on, on, on that side of things. Yeah, I just want to add that the uh, privatization of the liquor corporation, I think, is probably something that you guys can look at. Thank you. It's John Grant. I'm, uh, I work with the Mount St. Vincent University Students Union here. Um, I also grew up in rural Nova Scotia in Antigonish County, actually, and I've seen many of my friends uh, go on and get a college degree or university degree, and then they leave, many of whom will never return to the province because there's a lack of jobs here. Uh, we have some of the highest tuition rates in the country, second or third highest. We have graduates graduating with $37,000 in debt with for an undergraduate degree, which is making it really difficult for people to pursue things like entrepreneurial uh, endeavors because they don't want to take on additional debt. Um, we've also seen a rapid increase in unpaid internships in the province. Uh, we have them in programs like human nutrition as well as child and youth studies here at the Mount. Um, and these things are also helping to stunt the economy. People aren't able to buy homes or start families. They're doing this later in life now. Um, it's also eliminating entry-level jobs for recent graduates. Um, our youth on an underemployment rate in Nova Scotia is upwards of 30%, which is pretty staggering. Um, and our graduates, like I said, they're just they're leaving the province once they graduate. It's an incubator for youth, and then they're gone. Um, so my question is, uh, it's absolutely crucial for the provincial government, obviously, to retain youth. Uh, to have a tax base to fund things like education and health care in the future. So what is your plan or what is the budget's plan to help retain youth in the province? So uh, to that end, I guess a, a couple of things, and, I, and I've mentioned a few of them uh, earlier. So you have things like, um, you know, the... Uh, graduate opportunities when you're talking about getting that employment and that job. You know, one of the things that we heard from, uh, from students and, and youth, uh, and when we talk about youth, it's often defined just for quantifying what youth is. Uh, some of my colleagues still consider me youth, so uh, yet in this room, I, I'm not feeling so youthful. Um, but uh, 15 to 24 year olds, roughly, is you know, 
a definition from an employment perspective of, of youth. Um, so within that group, uh, you know, we hear that, right? What's going to keep you here in the province is getting the job, that first job. What was the barrier that we heard most frequent was an entry level job, whether it's in the public sector or the private sector, says two to five years experience. Well, how do you go from community college or university with zero experience to an entry level job with two to five years experience requirement? You don't, and that was the barrier. That was a big barrier, and we, we saw that, and we've worked on that, and we created programs, the START program, the Graduate Opportunities program. Graduate Opportunities program provides 25% of the salary for a, an entry level position, new graduate position, uh, in the first year, and 12.5% in the second year. Because what we heard from the, employee, the students looking for work, what the challenge was, well, how do you fix the, the, the problem? Well, then we go and talk to the employers and say, well, why is it that you have two to five years? What they said was, it costs more, right? Anytime you bring in a new employee, it, co it costs money to get them integrated into your organization and before they're productive and fully productive as an employee. Well, that cost is a bit higher for a first full-time job, a first permanent job after the school system, right? Uh, after, after you come out with your, your training. So it does take time to integrate them into not just the organization, but generally into the workforce as you transition from being a student to being, what, what, do, you, what do we call ourselves? Oh, you're an employee, I got a career person, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, but that transition and the, the costs there are higher. So employers felt, let someone else incur that first two years cost. So we're like, well, if that's, that's the root cause, Let's create a program that helps address that. And that's what we did. And you say, well, what does it mean? There's still people, yes, there's still people going out, there's still uh, other jobs. Our, our unemployment rate in and of itself is greater than other parts of the province. So yeah, our youth, but also our general unemployment rate is higher too. It's a reality and an historical reality for not just this province, but this region. You know, there's a lot of talk about anyone from Alberta, but a lot of talk about the challenges in Alberta and their unemployment rate hitting 7%. Let's take a look at Nova Scotia and be happy for 7% relative to where we've been and where we're at. That's an improvement for us. So it just puts it in, the, in that sense. So we are investing in programs uh, and we're seeing results. Uh, just again, it was just uh, maybe a month ago, maybe a little less, uh, uh, early the, the new year, I don't remember the exact date, uh, stats did come out on youth employment. 1,600 new youth full-time jobs created in Nova Scotia since the last uh, uh, over, the, uh, over the year, um, a reduction of 300 part-time jobs. So it was a net employment of 1,300 new youth, but there were 1,600 full-time and a decrease of 300 part-time. We're seeing that transition and addressing that, that other side of the equation. We're looking for full-time employment for these, these, these people. So you know, we are doing things and, and we continue to look for opportunities uh, to support those initiatives. Um, uh, because we do want our youth to stay here, but we recognize we need to work with our employers to have the employment opportunity. But we also recognize that as government, we have a role to play as well. Um, so uh, recently, and I forget the name of the, uh, specifically the name of the, the, the program, um, but we went through all of our departments and said, well, we're asking the private sector to hire our youth. Well, when I was the Minister of Environment, uh, we're looking at five to seven years of experience for basically an entry level job. I said, well, how, how is that support of our youth? Well, there was an initiative undertaken looking at vacancies across all of the departments uh, in government, and we established an opportunity to hire, I believe, uh, upwards of 70 new graduates into the public service. Um, so we were leading by example there as well. So contributing um, by changing some of the, you know, in some cases we had to change uh, I think look at what opportunities and align uh, opportunities that uh, a new graduate could fulfill the opportunity where it made sense. We're, we are taking conscious steps and, and we look forward to doing more. Um, but again, it's, uh, we're seeing where the problems are, we're seeing where the opportunities to address them are and that's, that's what we're doing. Thank you, uh, Minister DeLore. Um uh, we are nearing the end of our session, and so I do want to encourage everyone sitting here in the room to take advantage of the cards that you have in front of you and note down what services uh, are um, important to you as Nova Scotians, as the Minister kindly asked us to do earlier. And I do have um, a few more questions, but uh, I, would, I would encourage you to, uh, to write your feedback to those questions. 
Good evening, Minister. My name is Chelsea Doyle. I'm a third year student here at the Mount in Business Administration. Um, my question actually touches on your previous question a bit. My brother uh, is an engineer. He works out in the oil fields and he has been lucky to keep his job for as long as he have, but he has, but he's looking at a very real possibility within the next year of becoming unemployed. Uh, we've talked at length, o length over the years about how he would love to come back to Nova Scotia, but there just simply isn't opportunities here for him to work. Um, as we've seen Canada wide and we've felt the very real, uh, result of having a GDP so dependent on the oil industry as a country, what steps could Nova Scotia take to start investing further into renewable energy resources and, you know, really spearhead that industry in Canada where we're not seeing that in a lot of other provinces, especially in a time like now where we're seeing such a dip in oil prices and such a, a loss of jobs in that sector. Thank you uh, for the question. You know, it's a, it's a great question. And again, uh, as with many of the, the questions, I, I think what I'm taking away from some of this is, you know, we don't seem to be doing a great job of beating our own drum uh, for things that we are doing. Um, I'd encourage you to, uh, to look up FORCE, F-O-R-C-E. Um, that's a, an initiative taking place in the province, uh, really looking at targeting uh, renewable energy of the tidal sector, harnessing tidal energy. Right? We don't have the same access to resources of traditional hydro uh, electricity that many other jurisdictions have. You know, other jurisdictions, many provinces across the, the country generate upwards of 95 to 98 percent of their energy, electricity, through hydro, relatively green uh, source of energy, and, and, and we don't have that luxury in Nova Scotia. So um, we do have these wonderful tides, though, in the Bay of Fundy. And so we've done some investment, some, some focused uh, uh, attention to that, doing research and development. This is a, a fairly early um, area. It's, it's, it's a developing uh, industry area uh, for development. We have the highest tides, some of the strongest tides in the world. So the energy potential in those tides is great, but also being a leader in the development of the technology means that manufacturing jobs could be created here. If you have the, you know, you develop the turbine that can handle it, the, the fundy, you could export that because it could handle the tides in essentially anywhere. So there is work being done uh, and uh, in that uh, in that space, and and we see opportunity and value in it, um, and and it's being done. So um, just to, to to highlight that it is being done. We may not be doing a good enough job beating our drum and letting everyone know that these things are happening. And it's a research center with the goal of, uh, you know, there's uh, four or five, I believe, uh, already identified. Uh, organizations, many of them international partners with local uh, companies uh, to get a berth to do their research and drop their turbines in. Uh, I think uh, there were turbines dropped in a few years ago. They got beat up so bad, uh, you know, many people looked at it as, well, that's a failure of the system, but the engineers, so if you say your brother's an engineer, engineers love failure because it's, they learn from it uh, and it makes the system better. So uh, the next uh, set of turbines, four, five different companies, I believe, uh, currently with berths doing the R&D and getting ready. And I think the um, Next uh, one slated to go in in the spring sometime. And uh, as far as what's the government role, I made reference to things like Invest Nova Scotia. You know, we aren't here, it's so early, to pick one of those companies to invest heavily in. Instead, we invest in force, the infrastructure, uh, getting the, uh, the power line from the water into the land so it ties into the grid so that the energy can go somewhere. We provide and support the infrastructure that can help support the industry. That's good investment. So back to your question, where do we get to see the returns? So then we see the returns because then many companies come to Nova Scotia to capitalize on the opportunity. If we had just done what we kind of traditionally do and say, who's the first company that's interested in doing work in Tidal and we'll go invest and give you a bunch of money, we actually create an uneven playing field and it, that incentive to one organization acts as a disincentive to some of the others. And that's why, again, back to that structural change of how we go about economic development, investing in industry segments, is about giving a, 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 a boost, level playing field across the board to help with, with all. That structural change is going into place. It takes some time for, for, for all of those changes to, to, to play out. But we do believe, we're, again, back to my first comments, it's a path, it's a, it, where we're going. We believe these changes are good for Nova Scotia and we will reap those benefits. All right, now for our last question of, uh, of the evening. Hi, Randy, or Minister Delory. I think I used to know you as Randy. Uh, my name is Paul Dion. I'm a director with a not-for-profit society, the Life Saving Society. And um, 
just wanted to congratulate you on your goal of sustainability. I think it's admirable for our children and my grandchildren. Um, I just wanted to talk a little bit about the voluntary sector. Um, some data shows that in excess of $2 billion worth of work is done in this province by volunteers. Um, that incidentally is about 20% of your gross budget. Um, and this work has to be sustainable because they do things that if the voluntary sector does not do, then government will have to step in and do it. So I guess I would urge you to consider the investment in the voluntary sector uh, for every dollar invested, you will probably get in the range of $28 back. And anyone who's my friend in the investment business here in front of me would tell you that's a pretty good return on investment. Um, so I, I guess I would urge you not to forget that sector. We always focus on the private and the enterprise, and I think that's important. But I think the voluntary sector is important. I perhaps you could speak to that. Thanks, um, Minister Delory. You know, it's not, uh, it's not too often I, uh, I found myself uh, surprised when I'm standing at the front of a room, given my background, and with you coming up as the last question. It's been a long time. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, so, uh, sorry, my mind just got sidetracked with thinking about before. You know, the, the voluntary sector, uh, of course, um, you know, what, uh, what it means to Nova Scotia and Nova Scotians. Um, and uh, you know where the voluntary sector applies. Um, you know we talked about healthcare. We talked about you know um, you know we can talk about other services, uh, firefighting, search and rescue. You know there are many many uh, areas where uh, we do see and, and, and very much value them. Um, I guess uh, at this point, uh, and you seem to have some, some data that you, you suggested there, I'm assuming you have some stuff. I would encourage you to, if you have some of that stuff documented, submit it in if you have specific ideas of, of uh, uh, programs or initiatives. Is uh, Again, send a submission in uh, with, with some details and, and background and, uh, that you have, uh, if you've, what you've got already, uh, and that can help take a look and see what, what might make sense.